Hi, welcome to Mindset and Learn Extra. I think I have to introduce this little thing. Okay, <laughs> very cute. I mean, can you just see? It's like it, it's like having my little daughter here. Okay. Um, so um, do you want to tell them yeah, who you are? Sure. I'm Katleho, and today I'll be doing your show no, with no, Kathy. No, no, we don't want to know about that. Where are you from? Okay, I'm We're from Santon. Uh, <laughs> from Santon, from okay. Santon. Yes, yeah. and what else? I study at Wits, yes. I and she's very Wits. nervous because I can feel her little hand here vibrating, so you mustn't be <laughs> at all sure, nervous, not at all, Katleho. not at all. Tonight not at I'm all. calm, I'm calmer than yesterday. Let even. me tell you, our learners are... Awesome. I know. Awesome, I know. awesome, awesome. I got great welcomes yesterday. Yeah. Everyone was so inviting. And yeah, so, oh, exactly. It was so we've got special learners out there and we welcome you. Thank and you. I, tr I really confused because I said it's viruses and bacteria, then it was viruses, then it was viruses and bacteria, then it was microorganisms <laughs> because we're introducing this whole thing today. So yeah. it's <laughs> a little confusing about what exactly we're it going is. to categorize yes. it as. So, Kat, so you tell us then what microorganisms. Doing. Microorganisms. And you know what? She actually did life sciences. So people, she'll be able to help great. you as well with any questions that yeah. you have. Yeah. So make sure that you send questions through so that we can sort it out at the end. But it's on classification of microorganisms. Yes. We're dealing with the four categories of vi microorganisms that you are going to be doing this year. And we're going to be looking specifically at viruses as well. All right. Sounds so? very exciting, Kathy. Let's yeah. just take it away without further ado. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. People, what we've got, life at molecular, cellular, and tissue level. This is one quarter of your work. It's an entire section. And we're looking at life. We're looking at organisms that are molecules and also cells. So uh, we're looking at molecular, cellular, and tissue level. Now, if you haven't been listening while well, we had the grade 10s on, all right, you start off with organelles, they make up a cell. And within that cell, you have the cell membrane and the cytoplasm and all the little cell structures um, that you have, the endoplasmatic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, the ribosomes, the nucleus, um, mitochondria, blah, blah, blah. You have all those things. Organelles make up a cell. Lots of cells make up tissue. Lots of layers of tissue make up organs. Lots of organs, or generally a number of organs, make up a system, and all the systems in our body work together to form us, the organism. And everything has to be balanced. If anything is not happy, it goes out of tilt, and we end up with a problem. So if you're not taking in enough water, your body becomes dehydrated, your kidneys are impacted, your blood pressure is impacted, and a whole bunch of things end up happening, including a bad headache. All right? So, um, and that's just a simple thing like not taking in enough water. If, for example, you lack iron, your hair will start falling out. You will get dizzy when you stand up. Your mouth will be dry. You'll get cracks on your tongue. You will feel awful. Your blood pressure will drop, and you will always be tired. Now, those are symptoms for a whole bunch of other things, but put them together, and it could be a simple thing like a good iron supplement. So, going back to what we are doing now, we're looking at the molecular structures, cellular and tissue levels of life as we know it. So, going across, we start off with viruses. But before we can tackle viruses, we needed to do what is called classification. Now, when we classify something, we group it. Okay, um, we group our springbuck rugby players. How? We call them the Springboks. Uh, we take our cricket players and we group them and we call them the Proteas. Okay, I'm trying to think who else. Bafana, Bafana. We've got our soccer players and we call them Bafana, Bafana. Right, so we group them, we classify them. And how, wh what are they? They are the best of the best of the best that this country has. You follow? So we look at grouping, we classify and group everything in our lives. Um, you will sit there and you'll classify your friends. And you'll say, That's, those are my good friends, 
these are my the friends that I know and sometimes have parties with and are acquaintances, but these people I don't want anything to do with. All right? You classify exactly the same here. So when we look at biology and life sciences, we say classification is a system of grouping organisms together. How? They must share the same characteristics. All right, so if you were classifying friends, your best friends would be the people that share the most characteristics with you. All right, otherwise, why would you be friends with them? Taxonomy, and these are terms you must know, taxonomy is the science of classification. So classification is grouping things, and taxonomy is that science. It's a science of grouping things together that have common characteristics that link them. All right, now, this is just all just information that you're supposed to know and that they can put into your exam papers. But in 1892, your tobacco mosaic virus uh, was identified, and by 1915, bacteriophages, they are very important, especially when you get to grade 12 as well. But those bacteriophages are used when we want to splice and for genetic engineering. And then in 1983, um, you also have the first time they identified our human immunodeficiency virus, or commonly known as HIV. All right. Now, I mean, if you think about it, 1983, and then you'll have scientists to come along and say, uh, many people, they believe, have died and been diagnosed as having died from other things when they actually did have HIV, but they didn't really know until 1983. And a lot of people ended up with HIV because they weren't testing blood. So if I had HIV and I went and I donated blood, my blood was infected, and they would check the blood for other things. They never, ever checked for this little horrible, nasty little boy key here. All righty, so what I've done here is shown you the five group classification, or five kingdom classification. Now, all living things on this planet are put into kingdoms, okay? And if you look here, there is, let's get another color here. Um, let's go with purple. So, there's one, and that's your prokaryote kingdom. And what do we have here? We have prokaryotic organisms, and you say, whoa, prokaryotic? What's prokaryotic or eukaryotic? Prokaryotic means before the nucleus. And eukaryotic means literally after the nucleus. So if something is prokaryotic, it doesn't have a proper nucleus. But it will have a, um, maybe a nuclear a, a sort of a nuclear area tissue where you'll have the, the DNA and the RNA in a sort of a located area, all right? In a clump, it may only have one DNA, but it is very, very simple. It doesn't have an actual nuclear membrane with pores and a nucleolus, a nucleoplasm, so it doesn't have a proper nucleus. It's before the nucleus. And eukaryotic, now if you look here, these are all prokaryotic, but the rest are eukaryotic. That means that they all have a definite nucleus. All right, so one, prokaryotic organisms, and that would be your bacteria and your cyanobacteria, the very basic little structures that, if you look at evolution in detail, they th that kind of organism has been around for a very long, 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 long time. All right, and then we go to our second group, and our second group would be fungi. And your fungi, what are they? They are a kind of a plant because they have a cell wall, but it's like a continuous cell wall. And they have like, they don't have cell like cross walls to, to divide those cells and make them separate. They are what we call coenocytic, which we will go into detail about when we get there. But our examples are yeast, which we use to make bread, molds, bread molds, you leave a psalmy in your bag, your school bag, for two, three days, five days, a week, two weeks, three weeks, 
And eventually your mother says, clean that bag out. And you take your school bag and you tip it out. And there is a Sami pack that's been there for three, four weeks. And it's got the most divine bread mold on it. All right. Greens and yellows and purples. Have, have you ever looked at the, the bread molds? I've seen those. They look hideous. Hey? Yeah. They look disgusting. I mean, they, it, but it, 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 it grows so quickly. And you I think, know. where? Where did you come In from? In just two days, you see those green crawling thing. Well, it's, it's like not really crawling. It doesn't crawl, but it looks like, like it can talk to you and bite you. Yes. <laughs> Yucky. All right. Um, and also, if you open a cupboard that hasn't been opened for a long time, it's got that moldy smell in it. Well, there you go. That's all part of the fungi kingdom. Then we go to the protist kingdom, and the protists, they're not protests, they protists. And these are protist, or we can call them protista, and put an A there. just depends on, on who's teaching you and who lectured you and what textbooks you're using. But your protista, you're also eukaryotic, so they have a definite nucleus. And here, it's the organisms that haven't been classified into any of the other kingdoms. So they're your protozoans, they're your slime molds, they're your algaes. Um, that they little organisms, they have cross walls, so they're more advanced than, than your fungi, but you're like your mosquitoes. Your mosquito, uh, uh, at least not your mosquitoes, your malaria, your um, amoeboid, any kind of amoeboid disease that you can get, like typhoid. And what did they have in the trenches in the Second World War? I'm trying to think. Um, mean like, no, not so well, they had all kinds of, of, of dysentery yeah, and all those kind of are caused by these disgusting little things here that go into protists. All right. Then we have the plant kingdom, which we all know. You go outside, you see your ferns, you see your mosses um, on the brickwork, where, the, where the, if, you know, if, if it's very moist. Um, your cycads, your gymnosperms, our Christmas trees, our pine trees, um, angiosperms, all the flowering plants that are out there, although there aren't that many at the moment. Why? Because it is now heading towards autumn. All right. So... That's your plant kingdom, your animal kingdom. Oh, people, we start off with sponges and your cnidarians and your flatworms and all the different worms and the mollusks and the annelids. Um, annelids or annelidas are your earthworms and all the wormy things that crawl around in the, uh, in the sand. And then you've got your arthropods, which are your um, uh, spidery things and your locusty things and those kind of insects. They just provide food for everything else in the whole bigger scale of things. You've got your chordates, and we are part of the chordates because we are called chordata. Why are we chordata? Because we have a spinal cord, and our spinal cord is enclosed by a structure which protects it. Right, so... So that's where the core data comes from, having the spinal cord. And the, the, uh, do you remember all the core data? Not all of them. <laughs> Come to think about the five groups. Okay. And you've got mammals, right? We feed our babies and we, we suckle them. Okay. So you've got your mammals and you've got your birds. Those are warm-blooded. Okay. And then you had your amphibians, the froggy type things. You have your reptiles, your snakes and your lizards and all the creely crawly things. Mm -hmm. And the last one is your fish. Ooh. Okay, people, so there are your five chordata groups. Okay, so that is basic classification. But sitting here at the bottom, um, and I see the dear darling that did my slides, um, added my viruses to touch this, and that's not correct. So what we've got is our prokaryotes, our fungi, our protistas, our plant kingdom, and our animal kingdom. Those are our five kingdom classification group. And the scientists can do it very nicely. Say, if it has A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it goes into one. If it has um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, it goes here. If it has A, D, F, G, and K, it goes here. And that's how they classify. So that's our five kingdom classification. But our little viruses over here, 
these little guys are shaman. They don't fit in anywhere. And why is that? Because are they living or non-living? Because they're the only living creature on this planet, if they are living, or in the world, as Jeremy Clarkson says, <laughs> in the world, who can crystallize. I mean, for heaven's sake, have you ever heard of a living thing crystallizing? No, it's impossible. You say, okay, well, let, let's give that one a miss because viruses are a very real thing. I mean, they cause us to be very, very, very ill, but uh, do they have a metabolism? No. Do they have RNA and DNA? Yes, but they have either RNA, if they attack plants, or DNA, if they like to attack animals. So, no. Do they have a digestive system? No. Do they have a respiratory system? No. Do they have mitochondria? No. Well, what do they have? Uh, they have a capsule made of protein. They have this boring thing that goes in, like a penetration corkscrew. And they have DNA, one strand, or a double strand, I mean DNA, or they have a single strand of RNA. And that's the sum total of what that little, it doesn't even have proper cytoplasm. So it has no metabolism. It cannot survive without a host. And based on that, the scientists said, no, no. Doesn't fall into the five kingdom classification. Viruses, you are just a confusion to us, but a very, very dangerous confusion. We are gonna shove you on a group right on your own. So they don't even classify. We'll call them group naught because they are not part of your five kingdom classification. All right, people. Um, now, if you can just please send those questions. Katlejo. Guys, you know you have a lot of questions to ask. Please send them through our Facebook page. It's facebook.com forward slash at Learn Extra. And our Twitter handle is at Learn Extra. Guys, I can see your questions and they are coming through. And in Papuli, don't worry, you'll get it. Kathy is brilliant. I wish she was my teacher. And get something to drink, guys. And we'll see you after the break. Welcome back, guys, to Life Sciences with Kathy and I. Um, Kathy, I think we have some questions as well now. Yeah, I, I, do you want to? Yeah, I, you see, I have to wear glasses, so I've got to. <laughs> Which question do you want? Board. <laughs> okay, people, um, the questions that are coming up there, and they're about five or six now, about where did viruses come from? Um, of, of, are there different viruses that are living and different ones that are non living? No. They can't be classified, all your viruses on this planet cannot be classified as living or non-living because the way scientists have grouped everything on this planet that is organic, in other words, that is made of organic tissue, is they've said, does it have a metabolism? Even your single-celled organisms, like a bacteria, um, has a metabolism. It may not even have a proper nucleus, but it has a metabolism. It is able to provide energy, it is able to absorb nutrients, and it is able to discard or excrete wastes, and also um, gases that, that are no longer useful, like, for example, carbon dioxide will be pushed out. Or in the case of some bacteria, they actually use carbon dioxide and punt out oxygen. Your algae, the same thing. So uh, does it have a metabolism? No. So hold on. All living things on this planet have anabolic and catabolic reactions happening inside, whether it's one cell or multicellular. But in this case, it's not happening. So they say, no, hold on, it can't be classified as living. So all your viruses are sort of stuck. They don't fit into those five categories, so they just dump them in a category on their own. They, are they living or non-living? No. Can't classify them as either. Where did they come from? Your guess is as good as mine. They are created. They, they, they are structures that mutate. Um, 
and they end up making us very, very sick because they are pathogens. And we're going to go to definitions that you need to know. So for the people that did post questions on, are they living or non-living? How do we classify them? Why don't they fit in anywhere? I hope I've addressed your questions. If I haven't, send questions to because we will tackle the last 10 minutes. We will dedicate to any questions that you've come up with or asking that you're confused about. All right, so here we go. Virology. You must know what the word virology means. It is the study. Anything with OG or ology on it is going to tell you it's a study. So it's a study of viruses, viro, virus, and viral diseases. And you, you have to know that, people. A virologist, well, hello, is a person who's trained in the field of virology. So those are your guys that are going to sit in a lab, and we are going to go and have blood tests done or um, they're going to take mucus or any bodily fluid that we have and they will send it off to the labs and the people at the pathology labs will check it out and say, uh-huh, this is the virus this poor person has. So that's a virologist. Then you have a virus as a very small organism that can only be seen, let me get a nice, not white, but a different color here. Okay, it's very small, that's number one, and it cannot be seen with anything other than an electron microscope. Now, we've done the microscope, and that microscope that we looked at is a normal school microscope. Your electron microscope um, enlarges things millions of times, otherwise we can't see them. Okay, then something else you must know the ELISA test, and the ELISA test, you don't have to know that it's an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay test. It's just the ELISA is used to check for the presence of viruses and also the virus antibodies. Because you must remember, the minute a virus enters your body, what happens? You start to produce a substance called interferon. And interferon is, an, is our antibody. It's like our soldiers. And, the, and, and interferon would be... Um, our part of our army, our, our SWAT team. And what they do is they like get on their kit and they get ready and they've got their whatever guns it is that they're going to be using. That's our interferon. And what do they do? They go in and they take all these viruses and they stop them from reproducing. And when the virus cannot reproduce, can it make more of its own? No. So when they basically run, conditions become unfavorable. They crystallize and we get rid of them. Okay, so the ELISA test links it all, or checks. We have here, you must know what a pathogen is and you must know what an antigen is, okay? So, a pathogen is a disease causing, why is this thing going like that? Okay, it's a disease causing organism. So, anything that's going to make you sick is called a pathogen. Right, um, anything is a pathogen. Antigen is a foreign substance that stimulates the immune system, okay, to produce antibodies. So if you, for example, were infected with a, a virus, a, a flu virus, the flu virus itself would be a pathogen, it would be classified as a pathogen, but the fact that it's foreign to your body and it also makes you produce antibodies, we call it an antigen. Right. It's not pro-you. It is anti-you. So it's an antigen. Anything that's going to cause or stimulate your antibodies. Okay. Now. If so, Kathy, sorry, can yep. I ask you something? Mm. So do we have viruses in our bodies even though we're not sick or diseased in any way? Yes. Yes. Um, for example... Katlejo, you have um, a lot of learners have, well, let me come and talk to you yeah. here so we don't have to go okay. click, click. Okay. A lot of people out there in South Africa would have cold sores. Yeah. You know, a good old little yeah. cold sore that yeah. you get? And what happens? You start with a little tingling, and the next thing you've got this crater that erupts, and you feel like it's a lobster flapping on your lip, okay? And you know you can't kiss anybody, yeah. and you can't touch your mouth and touch anyone else. And people else. are scared to even look at you. Yeah, because they don't want... Yeah. If they don't get cold sores, they don't want... Yeah. But what happens is, when your system is down, um, or you've been in a place where you've got very, very hot... Mm. 
um, what happens is your immune, immunity sort of drops a little bit. And the first thing it flares up is your cold, your cold sore. sore. So what that does is it tells you, you know what, hun, you need to actually take yourself, get yourself a pep, something yeah. to pep you up a little bit, maybe some B12 complex or whatever, to just, to just help your immune response system oh, as well. Okay. And then there are a whole bunch of tablets on the market um, that, that you can take to increase or boost your immunity. Yeah, and that, right. that helps with... But th that is a perfect example. Your cold sores are a perfect example of... Um, a virus living inside your body. It's called herp herpes simplex. And that just comes up here on your mouth. And yeah. it's so, you can't, so you can't kill a virus completely? In that case, that virus stays. But um, what we do have is, for example, except for HIV as well, mm. but um, if you're infected with flu, and you know a lot of people go during winter and they'll go and have flu injections, yeah. right? Um, and they'll say, what a waste of money, because you know what? I got sick anyway. I had flu three times this last winter, and those injections yeah. cost me blah, 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 blah. Because there must be about 10 billion different yeah, flu viruses flus. out there, yeah. and cold viruses out there. And your body becomes immune to each one. And as when you are run down, they go, ha, ha. I've got then you. they come, and they've got yeah. you. Th and they tackle your mm. system, and then your body makes interferon, which is your antibodies, okay. against it. And somewhere in your nucleus, think of your nucleus as a, having this big recipe book. Mm. And in there, it sort of writes, okay, flu virus number 465 uh, was <laughs> here, found this cure, that's the antibody we need to use. Next time, that virus comes knocking at our door. So when flu virus number 462 comes again, maybe a month later or yeah. a year later or 10 years later, uh, uh, whole lot. Oh, okay, oh, there yeah, we see, go. I've There's seen you the before. recipe. <laughs> Whoops, vops, vip. Yeah. Dish, dish, dish. Dead. Gun down. Can't even, can't even come in. Oh. Can't even affect you. But HIV is very different. And when we do HIV next week, in detail, you'll see why that HIV virus is incredibly clever. It's come in, it comes in disguise. It disguises itself, yeah. yeah. You know, it would, it would be like a, um, a man dressing up like a, a sexy, gorgeous woman. Like an undercover comes, cop sort yes, of. Yes, comes walking in and does its undercover oh work. And before you know it, slit all your soldiers' throats. And that's when you end up with AIDS. Wow. So, Interesting. all right. But your cold sores, perfect example of a virus that's in yeah. you and, and that you can never ever get rid of. Warts okay. as well, same kind of thing. I think we're going to ad break. Yeah, no, let's go cool. to an ad break. Guys, you heard very interesting stuff, and I hope you're all understanding a lot because, yes, we did cover a lot during the session. Um, get some energy stuff, and we'll see you after the break. Welcome back, guys. I've just been informed of very exciting news. We have 8,888 likes on our page. That is brilliant, guys. Thank you. And at, by the end of the show, we need to have 9,999 likes. So that's 888 and 999, guys. So keep liking each other's things. Keep liking the comments. Keep bringing on good comments so we can like them. And yeah, like the show as well. <laughs> Over to you, Kathy. Okay, people, here we go. Here we've got, uh, this is a tobacco mosaic virus. This is a, a, a very basic structure of a virus. Viruses have very, very definite shapes. All right. Uh, the shape will vary slightly from what you see here, but they are very pretty. They actually are very colorful in nature. Um, they are... Um, they actually are, if I tell you, pretty. I, I'm not kidding you. They are, you sort of look at them and think, wow. So even though they are pretty evil, they actually are quite good looking. All right, and that's what we need to be scared. Okay, what we've got here is you'll see it's divided into the head and the tail. So there's your head, which is your 
it is the capsid, and then you have like a collar area, and then these sort of things that stick down. It looks almost surreal. It looks like something out of an alien movie. All right, so you've got your protein, ah, which means we have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. You did this in grade 10. But you've got your carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen that makes up your protein capsule. And we call this capsule here. We call that capsule a capsid. So you can either call it a capsule, but the proper name is a protein capsid. All right. And the capsid itself is made up of cells which sort of cup along like that in layers. And those little cells are called capsomeres. All right, so the little ones. Then we have a strand in this case of RNA. Now just remember that if the virus has RNA, then it will attack plants. And if there is DNA, then it will attack any animal cells. Okay, there's this collar-like structure, which is really not that difficult to remember. And then you have this little piece here, which we'll call the tail. But at the end of the day, this entire structure, there's the tail. And then it's got these fibers that stick down from a, a plate or a base plate, which is this little plate here. I mean, if you really... Honestly, look at this. It looks like a, a, a rocket that's landing on the moon. And you think, whoa. I mean, look how incredibly geometric the shapes are. And that is what all viruses will have in common. They're very geometric. Um, and they actually are quite special. The fact that they can survive the way they do, they must have an incredible survival mechanism. Okay. Now, here we have a T4 bacteriophage. That's what I've just shown you now. And on this diagram here, they show you the head. There's your, this has got DNA. The fact that it's got DNA tells you that it's going to attack an animal cell. Okay, you've got the sheath or the neck area. And you have your tail fibers and the, and the base plate. Right, that's just another version of the same diagram. All right, now I wanted to show you what the Ebola virus looks like. Unfortunately, the color didn't come out here. But if you look at this, this little thing here, okay, um, it would be this part. So let's get our yellow. And you'll be able to see this. This would be, that should be one. Oh, this would be, Another, right, um, that one there is going to come here, along there. So you've got these, the, 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 the whole virus process. Now remember, Ebola virus is bad. It kills people within 48 hours. You are dead, finished, claw, overs, cadovers. Um, but they also argue, and a lot of scientists will argue and believe that the Ebola virus was created and when I say created, it was created in a lab. So what you do have when you have biological warfare, which is a form of genetic engineering, you find some really yucky people out there who want power, and pretty much like pinky in the brain. And it would be like saying, well, we want to take over the world, so don't worry about nuclear weapons. Let's come along and make a virus that we can let loose in the air or in the water or in the food supply of a nation, and you can literally wipe out an entire nation. You kill the people without destroying everything else around them. So you don't affect the crops, you don't affect the towns or the buildings. The people just drop down dead. All you'll have to do is get rid of them very quickly, otherwise they start rotting and decaying and then you have another problem. Okay, so a lot of people will tell you that the Ebola virus was created in a lab for biological warfare.
Okay, then we look at the, now I love this one, the H1N1 flu virus. And this H1N1 is the name that was given to it. This H1N1 flu virus, because they can't give them pretty names. So what do they do? They, 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 they name them according to the letters of the alphabet and then the numbers. So H1N1 flu virus basically was the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. And a pandemic means that there are a whole bunch of people that get ill quickly with the same disease and that a lot of people end up dying. Right, so this is what it looks like. Now, I mean, if you look at that, it actually looks like little puff balls. In fact, if I look at that, I think it's more like a sweetie. Uh, meringues, that's what they look like. They don't look dangerous at all. And if you think of that Spanish flu, it was absolutely terrible. And we had another spate of Spanish flu a couple of years ago, and you'll all be old enough to remember seeing people on TV, um, I think it was in China. Hey, Katlejo, can you help I'm me? Not I think sure it was in where China. It was. Come on, you would have been in about grade eight. Okay. And um, no, it was about your grade seven, grade eight, uh, where they, they had showed everyone walking around with oh, masks. Oh, yes. In the streets and yeah. at the airports, and they shut down airports because mm. they wouldn't allow people to get on a plane and go to another country because With of the... Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. so you've got all kinds of flus that are out there. And every now and again, one of them just lets loose, and it becomes a pandemic. Demic. Right. And that's when it's very serious. That's when it's like mega. Yeah. Okay, basically shut down everything around mm. the, so that it doesn't happen. Okay. Now, if we look at one of the questions we got was replication, replication of viruses. Now, every organism on this planet must be able to replicate, okay? Um, in other words, make more of itself. If we can't, we then cease to be as a species. So... Um, and that was people, when you get to evolu uh, at, at least diversity and um, evolution theories and all that kind of stuff that everyone goes, whoa, I don't want to do it. Read through it, understand it, because you can only argue about something when you actually know all the facts. You can't argue about something when you don't. And poor Darwin has picked up, and I really feel sorry for the man, but he's picked up so much flack about his whole theory of evolution because people think evolution, oh, okay, well, if I go to the zoo, I'm looking at this baboon or the chimpanzee or the gorilla, that's not my brother or sister or uncle or aunt or, or cousin. And you're right, it isn't, okay? But there, are, there will be human beings that you look at and you think, look at the way they're behaving. They certainly aren't relations of mine. I'm not even, they're not even part of the same species as I am because they can do the atrocities that they do, okay, or commit the atrocities that they do. So remember, knowledge is power. Now, if we look at viruses and replicating, um, you go and, and we go to a theory like, for example, Darwin had, which was survival of the fittest. And out of all the organisms on this planet, if any of them should have died out, and, and never, ever, ever been around for future generations, it should have been the virus. Because, hello, this thing can't even survive on its own. It has to be in a host. And if it doesn't have a host, it can't live. It can't reproduce. It has no metabolism. It's nothing but a piece of crystal. Okay? So you think, okay, brilliant, but now... How does it replicate? It must replicate. It must make more of itself, because if it doesn't, uh, how does it get to something else? Easy. And this is how. First step, and I've divided it all up into steps so that it's easy to learn. Okay? Step one, there's attachment. So the virus comes along, biddy, 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 biddy. Ah, oh, so living, breathing, eating surviving organism, and it goes to a cell and it says, hello, cell, and it takes its little boring structure. You know where the plate was? You had the plate like that with its little legs that came out like that, and in here, 
It had the DNA or the RNA, depending on if it was plant or animal, and it sort of basically drills a hole into the cell and it injects its RNA strand or its DNA strand. But step one, attach, jigs. Step two, penetration. It says, uh-huh, give me my little cork borer. Let's make a nice little hole in that cell membrane, which doesn't really have to make a big hole. Why? Because the cell membrane, remember, is semi-permeable. This is okay, ch -ch 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 into the cell. Once we have step two underway, which is penetration, and it makes a hole through the cell membrane surface, it then inserts its RNA or DNA into the, now look carefully, carefully, the host cell. In other words, a virus is a Come on, I can hear you all saying, oh, for heaven's sake, Kathy, it's a p, a, come on, parasite. <laughs> because you can only have a host when something is a parasite. And people, you've done this since you were in grade five, all right? What do we have when we have a parasite? We have an organism that's going to benefit the parasite an organism that's going to suffer the host. So one benefits and one is harmed. But parasites are very clever because they don't, host, they don't harm their host so much that they kill the host off most of the time. But if they are a vindictive, nasty, horrible kind of virus, like the Ebola virus, okay, what does it do? It says, okay, well, you know what? We're going to kill this host in two days, guys. So you know what? We need a battle plan. We need a strategy. So you know what? We make sure that we infect, we mess those cells up, we reproduce, and we take our reproduced army. We make sure we get out of here into the next set of hosts as quickly as possible. Okay. That's when you find your viruses are very, very, very infectious. And when they are very infectious, you end up with a pandemic. Because just breathing on somebody, sneezing on someone, coughing on someone, or someone sitting next to you and you've just got all this layer of viruses all around them, it's, and there you go, they've got it in them. And the virus has survived. Okay, so host cell tells you it's a parasite. Step three, we have transcription. And what transcription is, is it replicates the RNA or the DNA, and you know what it does? It, it, it can't do it itself. So it takes your, the host, your DNA and RNA, and all the chemicals that you have in your cell available to your cells, and it says, cool, I'm going to replicate my own DNA and my RNA. So we have transcription taking place. And how? With all your stuff. I mean, what a cheek. It's like somebody coming into your room and using your stuff to look like you. It's, it's, it's just unheard of. All right, then step four, assembly. And when it assembles, it makes its little protein capsules around its nuclear material, and they're ready to rock and roll. And once they've done that, they burst the cell, so they destroy the cell. We've used you. We're out of here. Off they go, and they are ready to go and invade another cell or another organism. So step five is the bursting, it's the lysis. The lysis means to split. So it's the splitting of the cells to release all the viruses. So let's go through our steps again. Number one, attachment. Number two, penetration. It makes that hole. And what does it do? It injects its RNA and DNA into the cell. Number three, as if that isn't enough, this little guy now basically replicates its DNA, or if it's an animal virus, its, uh, uh, its DNA if it's an animal virus, or its RNA if it's a plant virus, using your cells, tools, chemicals, DNA, RNA. It basically transcribes its own RNA or DNA. And then, once it's done that, you have lots of little DNAs or RNAs floating around. The capsid forms around it. So it's protected by its protein capsule. And then, hello, makes your cell burst. Step one, please, you've got to know these people. Step one, attachment. 
Step two, penetration. Step three, transcription. In other words, duplicating the RNA and DNA. Step four, assembly. Step five, dead as yourself. Any questions? Send them. Yes. How much time have we got? Um, I think we've got about five minutes. Oh, okay, cool. Six minutes. Six there minutes. Are, there oh. are some questions. Um, okay. Guys, as you've realized, Kathy's answered most of your questions. She's just that awesome. I think she's psychic. Um, oh. But you do have some questions. Um, like Moh Mohali asks, um, do viruses have different shapes and sizes? Yes. Yes, and you know what I've got? I've got the most awesome picture, which we're going to do next week, or, or, or I think it's in three weeks' time, when we go through all the diseases. And I'm going to show you exactly what the HIV virus looks like. You see that virus? It's very fashionable. It's got the pinks and the purples doll and the cerises. I mean, and you look at that and you think, what a miserable little nasty piece of work. But it's actually beautiful in structure hmm. right they're very very clever but they have various structures but generally very geometric okay and if they have rounder shapes they are um, they look people like works of art you can't draw a virus without a, um, a protractor and a, you, you know you know all those all different those little shapes and shapes. things that architects yeah. use yeah you, you'd use those shapes you would actually use predetermined shapes oh, wow. um, to draw them because there are no flowing lines or flowing structures. They're very rigid, rigid in their shapes. Right, so getting back here, we've got our protein capsid containing the virus DNA or RNA. Remember DNA, animal, RNA, plant. Your viral genome, now remember the genome is its genetic information which is written on the DNA or the RNA, that gets injected into the cell, and this is your bacterial cell. Now, this would be specifically your, your, your um, viruses that attack bacteria, and your bacteriophage genome is then immediately released in here, and it changes our poor little bacterial cell. All right, here we have quite a cute little picture which basically shows the whole process. Let's do green. Okay, um, here we've got our little cell and what happens? The virus attaches. Boom. Step one. Step two, which is that's one. Step two, penetration. Step three, in here, we have replication happening at a rapid rate of knots. So both of these would fall under, under um, replication. Then assembly, what is it doing? It's saying, hold on, let's get the capsids, let's get our little uh, uh, um, structures, our landing gear, our plates, our everything. Let's get all of that sorted. So assembly would be to just put their clothes on, if you can think of it that way. And at the end of the day, here we have our lysis, which is going to be, we have repli hang on, entry, three is replication, four is assembly, and five, here we have lysis, which is the release of all these little new viruses are released into the bloodstream. Okay, so that's basically the, st the process. People, please remember lysis means to split. And replication is by transcription. So what it does is it transcribes or copies, replicates its own DNA or RNA using the host cell's RNA and DNA. Okay, uh, come on. I think my nails are too long. I need to cut them. Okay, now, um, I'm not going to do immunity with you. Okay. So let's just go back. I'm really not going to confuse our learners with immunity. I think we've got two minutes, don't we? Yeah, we have two the, minutes What left. questions have we got um, here? Let's have a look. Okay, so I have a question here from, I think it's, let me check again. I think it was Mohali. Yeah, if, for example, bacteria is in milk, is there a test or solution for detecting the bacteria without using the microscope? 
So do you know no, that bacteria no. is there? Generally, and, and, and um, people, what we'll do is we'll get to um, bacteria later on, but with your, and, and I'm not sure where I'm supposed to be looking. <laughs> We've got cameras in the studio and I'm not sure which one I'm looking in. Okay, people, with regards to bacteria, we'll be doing that next week. Oh, awesome. All right. Um, but your, your easiest way to identify if there are bacteria at work in the milk would be to smell it. If it smells off or when you put it into your coffee or tea and it curdles, then you have a problem. Okay, um, but other than that, no. Okay. So you would just, just be careful. I mean, just buy proper sterilized milk. Yeah. Right. Kathy, thank you so much for an awesome That's show. It's a pleasure, my darling. Time has gone so fast. You're only here for an hour today, yeah. hey? Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. People, I hope you're nice to Katlejo. She's very sweet. I mean, like, this is such a thank sweet you. little thing. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. You know, next to me being so tall, <laughs> I mean, she's... Guys, remember to tune in next week for Kathy. I mean, she's awesome. I had a great show, guys. Thank you Thank so you much darling. for all your questions and all your answering each other's questions. Well done, guys. Remember to study smart and study hard. And you know what? As Katleho says, help each other. Uh, the best way to learn is when you're teaching other people. Yes. All right. It yes. is, is, it's, it's awesome, wonderful, and it's sharing. Sharing is caring. Have a good one. See you next week. See you next week.